Okay. Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome and hello from QI Talk Time. We're delighted to launch our Autumn awesome Winter series today with Margaret Murphy, who's going to speak to us on the patient experience as a catalyst for change. So we have probably some of our uh, recent QI Talk terms, but some new joiners today. So welcome to QI Talk Time. QI Talk Time is um, a WebEx facility which provides an opportunity for colleagues across the health and social care settings to learn from leaders in improvement, integration and innovation. And we're going to be um, doing this twice monthly on a Tuesday at lunchtime, so from one to two every second Tuesday, so we're hoping that you'll be able to join in. So just hold on the slide. Nice. So Margaret, um, following the death of her son as a result of a medical error, Margaret has become very actively involved as a patient safety advocate. She works as a WHO as an external lead advisor for the Patient for Patient Safety, um, which is connected into over 500 um, patient safety champions in 52 countries. The focus of her work relates to seeing adverse events as having the potential to be catalysts for change as well as being opportunities for learning, identifying areas for improvement, and preventing reoccurrence. She promotes this viewpoint at local, national, and international levels as an invited presenter to conferences, hospital staff, and students. <coughs> so we hope that the, the session today will be interactive, that you can all hear okay through the sound. The chat box function is on the right-hand corner of your screen. Make sure to Click into that if you have any comments or questions or ideas. To write the session, please do that. We will have time at the end to address those with Margaret. And please follow QI Talk Time on Twitter, at QI Talk Time. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Margaret to bring us through her talk. Thanks a million, Margaret. Uh, thank you very much, and I'm delighted to be here this morning. And I realize that we have quite a mixed bag of people who have tuned into this uh, QI talk time. And I'd just say a special hello to Eleanor Rivoire, who's tuned in from Canada. I'm looking forward to seeing you and having lunch with you next Monday. Now, <coughs> now through the medium of this we webinar, I am really very pleased, as I say, to have the opportunity to address what I consider to be the heart of the matter, which is the patient experience of care, and to suggest that that experience, when both valued and validated, can drive improvement in all spheres of healthcare, policy making, standard setting, research, regulation, clinical practice, but most importantly, in the area of education providing the opportunity to bring about sustainable culture change through engagement with the next cohort of healthcare professionals. We speak about effective co-creation, something which can only occur when the patient and family are viewed and employed as a resource. It requires a structure that we learn from the raise and death of healthcare. And what is the raise and death of healthcare? It is, in fact, the man in the bed. And we need to come to a very real understanding of what constitutes truly patient-centered care, while bearing in mind that the patient is the single entity which is present throughout the full continuum of care, is a wonderful repository of useful information, and crucially is also the individual with the greatest vested interest in the outcome. It is important that learning, any learning, be derived from reality as well as from theory, that it comes from real people, staff at the coalface and the patients and families who entrust their well-being and that of their loved ones to you healthcare professionals. And in this context, it's also interesting to consider the results of a recent survey conducted by the Irish Medical Council, and I'm a lay member of that council, and this council addressed public perception in relation to uh, uh, Sorry, I'm just fixing the sign with a bit of feedback that the sign. Yeah, that's perfect, Margaret. Sorry. Okay, fine. Uh, in, in relation to public perception uh, about the various professionals, uh, the respondents to that survey, over 90% of them said that they trust their doctors to tell the truth. Now, trust is paramount in the healthcare professional and patient relationship. You are the professionals who do hold our lives in your hands, and we, in turn, 
want to be able to hold you in high regard. And in the light of those survey findings, isn't it all the more unacceptable than ever that level of trust, that high level of trust, can sometimes be betrayed? So for that reason, open disclosure and respectful management of adverse events will feature strongly in my presentation, as will patient engagement and involvement, together with the critical matter of firstly recognizing and then responding appropriately to the deteriorating patient. I also ask that you would engage with your own perspective on such issues, your experience to date, the aspects of delivering care that have met with your satisfaction, and the areas that left you disappointed and wanting to do more. I have a further question. Are you prepared to own the fact that you're a very privileged individual? You have been blessed with high-grade intellect, benefited from superb training, but most importantly, because of your roles, you are gifted with the opportunity to serve humankind on a daily basis, something which is truly awesome, all of which should, in fact, be very humbling and has the potential to allow you to live fulfilled and very satisfying professional lives. When we have finished the session and before you return to work tomorrow, perhaps you might consider what, if anything, has changed in your perception. Has your resolve changed? And what will be different in your everyday practice? Importantly, do you sub subscribe to the maxim, the good professional treats the disease or the condition, the great professional treats the person who has that disease or condition? Gatherings such as this force us to consider issues, such as, for example, leadership, the kind of leadership we want to need. It has been said what distinguishes leaders from managers is that managers help people see themselves as they are, while leaders help people see themselves better than they are. Collaborative partnership is now generally accepted that patients, healthcare professionals, policymakers, and healthcare leaders should all be working together. Prevention is better than cure. Achieved through intuitive vigilance, recognizing and responding to the deteriorating patient, and the case history I will present will certainly deal with all of that. Dilemmas, dilemmas faced by frontline staff. I have met countless frontline staff who, for example, want to do the right thing in the aftermath of an adverse event, but they are fearful of putting their heads above the parapet. Sorry, Margaret, I'm just going to check here the sign to see people. Okay, perfect. That's fine. Thank you. Sorry, Margaret. Not a bother. Uh, people who say they are fearful of putting their heads above the parapet, they ask the question, do you want us to give patients information which they can then use against us? There is something very flawed even toxic in a system, which produces those kind of anxieties, where what people actually need is the support to do the right thing. And then, of course, there is the whole area of trustworthiness. The trustworthiness of systems and individuals is most severely, it, the button forward isn't working, it is most severely tested in the aftermath of an adverse event in how disclosure, transparency, and open disclosure are played out. I'm convinced that disclosure is not about blame. It is not about accepting blame. It's not about apportioning blame. Rather, it is about integrity and being truly professional. It's about learning, and above all, it's about preventing recurrence. A burning question then becomes, why do essentially decent and professional people often behave in an inhumane way in the aftermath of adverse events. So for guidance around that, and uh, as a template for action, I refer you to the IHI white paper, Respectful Management of Serious Clinical Events. The current health care reality has spawned the patient advocates, people such as myself. As WHO Patients for Patient Safety Advocates, we're, we're not career advocates, we're volunteers. 
we are committed to being collaborative partners and co-producers of safe care. Circumstances have brought us to this work. We have not chosen this work for ourselves. Rather, it is the responsibility which has been thrust upon us, one which we would gladly forfeit for the restoration of the lives and well-being of our loved ones who have been harmed by health care, albeit unintentionally. We strive to have these experiences become catalysts for change in an improved health. We accept that we cannot change the past. I, for one, would dearly love to be able to change the past. But what we can do is we can use that past to inform the present. And in the present, we can then influence a better future. And isn't it so much better if we do that together in partnership, which can be summarized as a process of empowerment of patients and families by enablers within the system. Our patient role in that partnership is best articulated in the London Declaration, an output of the first Patients for Patient Safety workshop held back in 2004, and which says, we Patients for Patient Safety will be the voice for all people, but especially those who are now unheard. And again, in honour of those who died, those who have been left disabled, our loved ones today, we will strive for it so that all people receiving health care are as safe as possible, as soon as possible. This is our pledge of partnership, our patient pledge of partnership, and certainly my Margaret Murphy pledge of partnership. <coughs> the preferred commitment from healthcare says, we will proactively engage patients in their own care. We will capture in every way possible the lessons to be learned from the care experiences of our raising death, the patient. And over and above that, we will embed patient and family into every aspect of our organization's activity. We can then deliver a system of care within a framework, such as that described by the Irish Commission on Patient Safety and Quality Assurance, as knowledgeable patients receiving safe and effective care from skilled professionals in appropriate environments and with the best outcomes. And then, of course, there is the matter of culture. Michael Leonard, a physician leader for patient safety in Kaiser Permanente, offers, offers us a very simple definition of a culture of safety. No one is ever hesitant to speak up regarding the well-being of a patient, and everyone has a high degree of confidence that they are concerned will be heard respectfully and acted upon. Do you do that? Are you enabled to do that? Does the environment in which you work foster that? When making the case for engagement, we are supported by, for example, the report safety first 2006, which says that around the world, healthcare organizations that are most successful in relation to patient safety are those that encourage close cooperation with patients and their families. Why do I use the 2006 quote? I use it because we are still saying the same thing in 2017. I feel we should have moved much further ahead in that intervening period. Of course, there are, and there will be, if you like, challenges. I have heard Jim Conway, Senior Vice President of IHI, describe the push-pull dynamic of that engagement process as making the status quo uncomfortable while making the future attractive. And that is what I'm asking you to be, to be that little piece of grit in the oyster, causing sufficient irritation to bring about the pearl. And in this case, the pearl could be healthcare improvement. So then, maybe it is time for me to explain where I fit into all of this. Like many others, I have undertaken advocacy work because of a negative experience of healthcare, the needless death through medical error of our 21-year-old son, Kevin. And I suppose today, September 26th, it seems somewhat surreal for me to be uh, partaking in this WebEx on what is Kevin's anniversary, the 26th of September, 
1999. Two aspects of the experience have influenced my resolve to be a collaborative partner. One was that every point of contact in our Irish healthcare system aided Kevin, and secondly, that injury was further compounded by the very real fact that learning opportunities were frustrated by damage within patient efforts after his death. And I would contend that the duty of care to a patient doesn't end with the death of the patient. So consequently, the burning question for me did become, did become, can a tragic outcome be a catalyst for change? And for your part as healthcare professionals, you might ask, why would, why would we listen to a lay person like Margaret Murphy? What does she have to offer? We're highly trained. Why would we be interested in the views, the stories of lay people? Well, in reply, I offer the Indian proverb which says, tell me a fact and I'll learn, tell me a truth and I'll believe, tell me a story and it will live in my heart forever. And patients like my cousin certainly have very powerful stories to, to tell. So let us proceed with that story and see what emerges. The most effective tool we have is to tell those stories and why, because the stories evoke feelings. In 1967, Vera Keane wrote in the Bulletin of Nurse Midwifery, facts do not change feelings, and feelings are what influence behaviour. The accuracy, the clarity with which we absorb information has little effect in us. It's how we feel about the information that determines whether we will use it or not. Uh, she got it, and I can certainly vouch for some of the feedback I get, I get. Not so very long ago, I was leaving a conference in London, and a Welsh doctor was in the list with me, and he said the usual thank yous, and he said, you know, Margaret, I'm taking a lot home, pointing first to his head and then to his heart. He got it, because it is about the intellect, the heart, the compassion piece, and it's about the skin piece. Just as I said in the British Medical Association motto, which tells us care needs to be delivered with head, with heart, with hand. Simple measures save lives. Simple measures were not taken and Kevin lost his life. And as I say, every point of contact failed him. And in particular, his case history clearly illustrates that in the case of an acute ill patient, there is very often quite a long antecedent period during which successful intervention is possible. And for Kevin, that period spanned almost two years. I offer you the ultimate efficient data in relation to Kevin is his death certificate. It lists multi organ failure, hypercalcemia, parathyroid tumour. It is most unusual for somebody to die from primary hyperparathyroidism especially when blood tests revealed high levels of calcium almost two years before his death. Adverse events happen to real people. Kevin was more than a statistic, he was more than a medical condition. He was a young man full of life uh, in his early years in college. He could be a challenging young man. I certainly knew how to push all my buttons. He could make me proud of him, he could make me disappointed in it, he could make me laugh, he could make me cry, but more than anything else, he was my beautiful boy, handsome, strong and carefree. Kevin was admitted to hospital eight days after this picture was taken. He had returned from the United States where he had spent the summer on his day, J1 visa and he came home early to attend his sister's graduation. Three days following that admission, she and I sat at his bedside in ICU. Kevin had died right before our eyes. Nothing or no one had prepared us for this. We had questions, we needed answers. How can a young man go to hospital on Thursday and be dead on Sunday? What was wrong? We need to know, we need to understand. Can you help us with all of that? What we encountered is closing ranks, lame excuses, muddying of the waters, and protestations of loyalty to colleagues. So disappointed and frustrated as a family, we retraced Kevin's medical history over the previous three years. 
that we had to do without any support, and the story slowly and painfully unfolded. The failings were many in number, they were serious in nature, they were indicative of system breakdown, compounded by misdiagnosis, inappropriate treatment and management, together with issues of communication and data handling. And as you engage with these journeys, I ask you to consider how laboratory results were we mishandled, how those results provided sufficient data which if interpreted correctly and acted upon promptly would most certainly have saved his life. In fact, the potential to achieve proper diagnosis and treatment was, I would say, sabotaged. Sabotaged by a combination of filtering of test results and inaction. And those errors range from his treatment of right primary care level right through to that afforded him in a tertiary training hospital. And that's why I say every point of contact failed him. And what was that unfolding story? As I say, two years before his death, he presented on a number of occasions with persistent back pain. Without any improvement, he was referred to an orthopedic consultant in the autumn of that year. Blood tests revealed high levels of calcium at 3.51 millimol per liter in a normal narrow range of 2.05 to 2.75. Other parameters were also raised. And all of those abnormal results were underlined in the laboratory report. But when writing to the GP, the consultant underplayed the high calcium levels and completely ignored a plasma creatinine level, which already indicated more than 50% loss of overall renal function. Now that letter is not in the GP file. We know it was written. We don't know if it was sent. We don't know if it was received. All we do know is that letter did not trigger any action. And consequently, the consultant's intention to see Kevin again early in the new year was never conveyed to the patient. It's also significant that throughout his care, only one set of clinical eyes saw the entirety of those particular test results. At no point in his care was the hard copy forwarded and neither did it travel with Kevin himself as part of a patient health record. And I'd be a great advocate of patients holding records of laboratory test results, not in any way suggesting that we would have the capacity to interpret them, but we would be sufficiently interested to compare one set with a previous set and be tempted perhaps to ask relevant questions, why is this changed from that to that? And the questions might in fact trigger appropriate action. The opportunity to initiate best practice was thwarted. First of all, by not recognizing the seriousness of his condition, then the absence of a system to flag the high calcium meetings in a way that would have insisted on immediate referral, and then not communicating the test results in their entirety, and thus preventing the patient from having the benefit of that second pair of eyes. Kevin's file contains a notation by the doctor's secretary, and I'd like to read it for you. It says, telephone call from patient's mother. She's extremely worried about her son. She wishes you to know that she thinks he may be depressed also, failed his first year exam, repeating and not doing well either, finding it hard to study, is now remaining in bed a lot. And this from usually a highly motivated and bright young man. She has arranged an appointment with Dr. X, a psychiatrist, tomorrow and would like to add the results of the blood test bone scan for the consultation. And you might wonder, why is she doing that? We had become weary from returning him to GPs, taking here, there and everywhere, and not coming up with any explanation for what we saw as something not being as it should be. She wonders if he really has the back problem. What can I tell the mother? She wished to speak to you. Results in five. And the doctor's response? Fax results to Dr. X. There was no communication with the mother. There was no direct communication with the patient. Carers and family members are often dismissed as being over anxious. And I would say that you ignore that you peril the concern of a mother. I assure you that umbilical cord is never totally severed. 
The patient and family are critical components to any integrated care process. And my understanding is that one of the aims of an integrated care pathway is to improve clinician and patient communication and patient satisfaction. So as a family, we trusted the healthcare system and we trusted individuals. And after repeated consultation, Kevin was on each occasion returned to us as seemingly healthy without any explanation for his sometimes unacceptable and erratic behavior. And only later did we learn that that was due to the chemical imbalance caused by his undiagnosed medical condition and the fact that while his bones were being starved and softened, the viscosity of his blood was being altered and putting a huge strain on his heart. When adjudicating on the quality of Kevin's care in the autumn of that year, uh, peer reviewers later said things like the combination of bone pain, hypercalcemia, and renal failure in a young patient points either to a diagnosis of primary hyperparathyroidism or metastatic malignancy, and these ominous results should have been investigated as a matter of urgency. He would have had surgery to remove the overactive parathyroid gland. He would have been cured and would still have been alive today. Now, research tells us that the procedure to remove what was, was discovered at autopsy to have been a benign adenoma adjacent to one of his parathyroid glands has a 96% success rate with a 1% complication rate. Our family experience also bears that out because, as I'm sure you know, the condition can be familiar. And three months after Kevin's death, his dad presented with the very same levels of calcium that Kevin first presented with. And we saw him have the procedure, which Kevin should have enjoyed, and he is alive and well today. There were wonderful odds in Kevin's favor, but we do know that nobody was at the race. And every point of contact did fail him. The necessary referral to an endocrinologist did not happen. The diagnosis of primary hyperparathyroidism wasn't made. And hypercalcemia was allowed to progress for a further year and 10 months, by which time the levels were higher than any ever recorded in Cork University Hospital and were described as inconsistent with life. Kevin spent the summer of 99 in the United States. On his return, he attended his GP, complaining of lethargy, occasional vomiting, continuing bone pain. Blood and urine samples were taken, and the test results were telephoned to the surgery the next day. Why? Because the laboratory people were concerned at the high calcium level, now at 5.73 millimoles a litre, were gone off the Richter scale. However, another key point of contact failed him when the GP, ignoring the high calcium levels, only included in his letter of referral to the hospital those elements of the blood test results which supported his own differential diagnosis of leptospirosis. Now, he did send the postage with the letter. But another point of contact failed him because when compiling the file in the hospital, not wishing to have this postage lost, somebody had the bright idea to stick it to the back of the letter, of the referral letter. And as a consequence, it wasn't seen until six weeks after Kevin's death. Another point of contact failed him. You know the expression, a life hanging on a thread? You could actually say that at that point in time, Kevin's life was hanging on something as simple as a post-it note. Not acceptable in the last year of the millennium in a first world country in a tertiary training hospital. The standard blood test in that hospital did not include for calcium, though so throughout his time there, they remained unaware of his dangerously high calcium levels and a diagnosis of nephritis was made. Nephritis is a symptom, not the underlying condition. So at this time, no medical personnel seemed to appreciate how seriously ill he had become. I recall speaking with a consultant in the hospital corridor on the Saturday. He was due for transfer to CUH. They were still uh, focusing on nephritis, and there wasn't a, a renal unit in the Mercy Hospital. And I asked him, are you concerned at all about the delay in his transfer? Because I have this desperate sense of urgency, that umbilical cord. 
And before he had a chance to answer, Brian, uh, Kevin's older brother piped in and he said, well, what will they do differently in Sealy Health? And he said, oh, they'll do nothing differently. Perhaps they'll take a biopsy Monday or Tuesday. We were speaking on Saturday. Kevin was dead on Sunday. For Kevin, there was no Monday. For Kevin, there was no Tuesday. Despite his continuing decline, no alarm was raised. He became dehydrated, described muscle pain and neurological problems. His medical notes quote him as saying, I have crazy thoughts coming into my head. And those notes also show further advancing renal failure as two crucial days were lost during his stay in that hospital as yet another point of contact saved him. Finally, he was transferred to Cork University Hospital. This was a weekend transfer, and it was there that we first heard concern about calcium levels, now at 6.1. Unfortunately, he was managed solely at register level. Senior personnel were on call, but they were not appraised of his deteriorating condition. And we do not know why that is the case. And we really should know the answer to that. Was it a natural thing that I called on my watch? Or was it a case that I called in the recent past and wasn't received too well? Or was there some other reason? But we do need to know the reasons. We need to, want to dig deep into the layers of that. We need to ask the five whys. During Sunday, Kevin was lucid, but he was sleepy giving a thumbs up to his father and brother before they left the bedside in ICU. Nobody had intimated in any way that his life was in danger. It was all Ireland Sunday, Cork were playing leave. They headed home to see the, um, the, the balance of the match with the intention that they would return and, and switch with his sister and I at tea time. At 3.30 p.m., just as they left, the young SHO came in did a cursory check on Kevin, turned away, and before that young man reached the door of ICU, Kevin suffered a massive heart attack and died as his sister and I sat at the bedside. Attempts at resuscitation failed. I sent his sister running through the hospital corridor, and it all happened so quickly that she actually caught up with her dad and brother in the car park before they reached the car. They returned, uh, a nurse came out, a woman much my own age, and said, we have a room over here. And I looked at her and I said, it's not good you're taking us to this room. So when we went in, we were met by a doctor whom we hadn't met previously, and he said Kevin was very sick. And I said, is he gone? And he said, yes. Yeah. And I do know where my next words came from because and I didn't consult with anybody. Kevin carried a donor card, so I asked, what about organ donation? I suppose at some level, I desperately wanted some part of him to live. And the doctor shook his head. Kevin had been allowed to deteriorate to the point where his organs were of no use to any other human being. And that was really hard to hear. It was like Kevin dying twice. And the doctor was a kindly man, and he saw the effect that had. And he said, would you like us to inquire about his eyes? So we said yes. And his corneas were donated. And we later learned that a 60-year-old man and a 42-year-old woman were given the gift of sight. And that is Kevin's patient journey. And when we reflect on the journey, we can most certainly identify the shortcomings. There was the inability to recognize the seriousness of his condition, appropriate and timely interventions not taken, selective and incomplete transmission of information, non receiving of vital information. I would say that you're saying that you're communicating something of import to a colleague, the least you need to be assured of it that it has reached its destination. There was a total absence of an integrated care pathway. The link between his uncharacteristic behavior and the test results was not made. His developing neurological problems were ignored. And there was no tracking of his deteriorating condition. 
When we had access to the files, we plotted those test results ourselves. Sure, we couldn't interpret them, but we certainly could see that something significant was happening and nobody was doing that and responding to that. There was no longitudinal approach and there was serious absence of direct communication with the patient. There was his treatment at registrar level. How come his care was solely vested, if you like, in that one individual? There was a team dynamic. How come somebody in the team didn't speak up on Kevin's behalf? You know, what was the reason for that? And what do you do if you're a junior member of the team and you're concerned for your patient? And what do you do if you're the, the boss, as it were? How do you facilitate others to speak up? There was the impact of a weekend admission. Uh, why should things be more fragile at the weekend? There is, we could almost say that Kevin was asked to accommodate the system. The words were he said, but there was an implied, please stay alive until Monday. And Kevin just could do, not do that. And our expectations of a tertiary training hospital certainly were not met. And then in the aftermath, what was our experience in the aftermath of that? Yes, there were initial honest and humane reactions from individuals, and I'll always be grateful for that. In particular, I remember the nurse. She was sitting at the bedside with me. She was stroking my arm, and she was crying as freely as I was. And I was puzzled because we were in the ICU, and I said, well, but don't you see this every day? And she was quite emphatic. She said, oh, no, not that. That should never have happened. She was cross, and I'd be so grateful to her to my dying day. But in a very short space of time, all of that was replaced by a process of corporate damage limitation. One doctor described his dilemma as an issue of loyalty to colleagues. And I can understand loyalty to colleagues, but a young man had lost his life. And shouldn't there be some learning derived and some hope of preventing recurrence? Another head of department suggested in relation to the posted note, and I bring it up again, that even if the consultant had seen that, it wouldn't have meant anything to him. And I said, why? And he said, well, it's not written as we write it. So I said, may I see it? And then I looked at him and I said, are you saying that because it's not written in scientific notation, that it wouldn't mean anything to somebody like you? And the man actually said yes. A suggestion that CAL might not mean calcium, SOD might not mean sodium, and POT might not mean potassium, and they're all in each other's company. It was at that point that I lost faith, as I identified a reluctance to be honest, to be open, to just be a decent human being. And I suppose it was that response in particular which drove us down the road of litigation a family which would have never embarked on that route had we been treated with any level of decency. It also became clear that the legal system favours the defendant, especially in the areas of finance and resources. For ordinary people like ourselves, it was a David and Goliath experience. Until the 11th hour, every effort was made to settle without admitting of liability, a wearing down process that lacks compassion and consideration for heartbroken people. Cases like ours need to be heard in a non-adversarial environment where the focus is not on blame, but rather on honestly arriving at the truth, acknowledging what happened, and above all, of finding some way to prevent recurrence. Almost five years later, a judge of the High Court declared, it is very clear to me that Kevin Murphy should not have died. Two GPs, a private consultant, a hospital, and consultant in a hospital, all admitted liability, expressed their regret at Kevin's death and sympathised with his the family. Something which certainly could have been done within weeks of Kevin's death and, avoid, and have avoided a protracted court proceedings. And the disappointment for me was that all the focus was made in defending a lawsuit rather than on learning and improvement. Monetary compensation was never an issue for us. 
and as well, those apologies, none of them were made in person, they were made through legal representatives. So the ownership of those, represent, of those apologies is somewhat fragile. The sum of money doesn't equate, it would equate, equate to my Kevin. Neither could we imagine any circumstances in which we would derive benefit or pleasure for, from such money. However, before there was a settlement, or in fact, whether we would end up still having a roof over our heads, we signed off any future settlement to two charities, GOHER and the Make a Wish Foundation. So, there are other people embroiled in an adverse event. There are the healthcare staff. As patients, we can't give permission for error, but we do understand that healthcare is complex and that it is escalating, and I accept unreservedly that no one intended harm to Kevin. And there were three people we met. One was the awful man with the post-it note. We then met the SHO in the corridor of the hospital. All of this happened in one day. He and Kevin had quite a nice little rapport during the hours he was caring for Kevin. They actually went to the same school, so they did have something in common. So he sees us coming down the corridor and he crossed over and he said, oh, hello, Mr. and Mrs. Murphy, how are you doing? Kevin was very unlucky. And I'm really angry and I'm shocked. Last year, the millennium in a first world country and somebody is using the word luck. But I'm not mad at him. I'm mad at the people who left him with such a superficial understanding. And I'm not mad at him is because I really liked him. Because in the afternoon of Kevin's death, uh, Kevin's friends started assembling at the hospital, as you can imagine, and this young man came by. And what did he do? He took off his white coat, the barrier, and he sat with them. An amazing, say nothing, an amazing act of solidarity. Because in fact, was he not also grieving? He was grieving the loss of the patient. And I had a real sense that that act of his came from inside the innate decency in that young man. Uh, he didn't see that in any textbook. And was anybody going to recognize and nurture that decency in him? And I'm afraid I had no sense that that was going to happen. Probably he was being told you have to get back up on the horse which most likely he would have to do. Of course they'd have to do that. But you know, some horses are a bit tricky and you need a bit of a leg up. And I don't think he was getting that leg up. The third person we met that day, we were about to exit a list and the, the door opened and Hook stepped in to the registrar, the man who should have made the call and he didn't. Our eyes locked, I could see he was trying to place me. I knew him immediately. And all I said to him was, I'm Kevin Murphy's mother. His face blanched and he blurted out the words, I didn't think he'd die. And he backed out of the lift and he ran away down the corridor. I turned to my husband because we'd just come from that awful man about the post-it note and I said, oh my God, they've abandoned us, but they've abandoned him too. And there is that sense of shared abandonment between healthcare staff, patient and family. And he clearly wasn't getting the support he needed either. He and I never had the conversation we should have had. It would have been a difficult conversation, but I'm totally convinced that we would both have exited in much better condition. The adversarial system doesn't serve anyone. I, anybody, but I'm convinced that proper disclosure and openness would have been far more beneficial to all parties. So have I learned anything from all this? Well, I do have a wish list that talks about observing existing guidelines, best practice, and being prepared to challenge each other in that regard. Following events, take, undertake the root cause analysis, communicate effectively within the medical community, keep impeccable records, refer to them, and above all, act to them. Listen to and respect patients and family. Know your personal limitations. Replicate what is good and be always vigilant for opportunities to improve. Acknowledge error and allow the learning to occur. Learn, disseminate that learning. Practice dialogue and collaboration, meaningful engagement with patients and families. Create a coalition of healthcare professionals and patients 
And we're striving to do that with an Irish version of patients for patient safety. And above all, be honest, you know, we we'll seize the opportunity to give some meaning to tragedy. So Liam Donaldson describes the five most dangerous words as it could not happen here. Of course it could, and you need to be vigilant around all of that. Following that adverse event, there is uh, a window of opportunity. Albert Wu calls it the golden moment, and that opportunity is often lost because of the defensiveness they express loyalty to colleagues, to the organization, and to a flawed system. The result is lost learning, confrontation, and litigation. And the, some of the barriers have been identified as those inappropriate responses, the inaccessibility of the partnership opportunity, the culture of medical practice, this perception of false misperformance and infallibility. Nobody can operate out of that. No human being can be 100% right 100% of the time. And we need to factor that in into our system to protect clinicians and patients from natural fallibility. Fears relating to litigation and loss of reputation, excluding the patient and family in the change process, and neglecting to learn from industry. I have a doctor who works in medical devices and in stolen pharmaceuticals. They have corrective action reports. They're not punished for error. They're punished for concealing error because that is viewed as sabotaging the company. And there is a better way. I recall my very first meeting with Julian Donaldson, chair of the World of Alliance. Uh, he was interested in using Kevin's case history as a learning tool. He invited me to meet him in London. And here is this man, a knight of the realm. He walked into that room and, and Whitehall extended his hand and said, hello, Margaret, I'm Liam Donaldson. Sit down, talk to me. Sit down, talk to me. In five long years, nobody in this country has said anything as meaningful and as simple as that. And what did he do? He listened, he heard, he acknowledged that something happened that shouldn't have happened, he didn't offer any excuses, and on his fingertips, he enumerated the missed opportunities to save Kevin's life as he likened his patient journey to a manifestation of Jim Reason's this cheese model. And finally, he turned to me and he said, and you know, Margaret, any one of them would have been enough. And I returned home a considerably healed woman, conscious of acknowledgement, conscious of being hurt. And what did he do? Something very simple and valuable. He validated the patient experience. And then there's the wonderful story from the United States with Dr. Rick Pelt and Linda Kenny. She flatlined, he, may, he, was, he was the anesthesiologist who made the error, she flatlined. Thankfully, she was resuscitated. He wanted to speak with her. He was um, the youngish doctor who, when in college, was known as Iceman, so you know the kind of individual they're dealing with. But when all of that happened, he connected with a part of himself that even he didn't know existed, and he desperately wanted to meet with her. But he was discouraged on all fronts, hospital insurers, colleagues. But eventually they did meet the doctor and the woman he almost killed, and it was a difficult uh, first meet, uh, was a difficult meeting. But he says with great relief that on that day, an 800 pound gorilla got off my back. Now that's some image, toting around an 800 pound gorilla 24 7. And you can get shot of it by having a decent conversation with another human being. If there ever was a case for open disclosure, that is it. And it gets better because the pair of them set up MITSS, Medically Induced Trauma Support Services, which supports patient, family, and clinician when things go wrong. And I've seen them uh, present jointly at conferences, and I assure you, they're a wonder to behold. So what I'm saying is that it is critical that we preserve that very precious relationship of trust between doctor and patient, and initiate the powerful calendar, the powerful conversation, which is in fact dialogue. While there is no acceptable level of error, error will occur, and it's at that time that we're challenged to behave with integrity and seize the opportunity to give meaning to tragedy. In the name of patient safety, the onus is on us to see that translated into safer care for the man in the bed, the raising death, 
and ensuring a real sense of satisfaction for those working in healthcare. It's also very significant that Atolgoende has asserted that more than anything, what distinguishes the great from the mediocre is not that they feel less, it's that they rescue more. That responding to deterioration piece, and maybe that's the piece that needs to change. So, at many points during his patient journey, Kevin badly needed someone to rescue him, to respond to the deteriorating patient. My wish going forward is that whatever your role in healthcare, is you will do just that, that you will be rescuers. And finally, I want to emphasize that my call for care that is delivered in accordance with the BMA motto, with head, with heart, with hand, my call for reporting and learning, my call for transparency, accountability, and open disclosure, those and also for patient engagement and involvement as a right. All of that is grounded in one very real fact. I was present at Kevin's birth. I'm his mum. I know every detail of that birth. I was also present when he died. And as his mother, I needed and I deserved to know everything about the circumstances which brought that about. But over and above that, I needed to be assured that lessons would be learned and that the lessons would be disseminated, all in the hope of preventing recurrence. Because as Sir Liam Donaldson said, to err is human, to cover up is unforgivable, but to fail to learn is truly inexcusable. So thank you for keeping me company in this weather this afternoon. And God bless you all. Uh, thanks a million, Margaret um, Roisin here. Um, just to say thank you so much for sharing such a powerful story with everybody online. There's been a few messages and comments saying how touched they are by your story. And really, I suppose the learning is that we just don't want this to happen again. Um, and I suppose you've, in some of your slides there, you talked about some of the things that we might try to do in terms of improved communication, treating people like you would like to be treated yourself. There's lots of different ways in terms of your team working, in terms of handover. There's multiple things that we can do to stop this from happening to anybody else. There have been no questions. I think people have just been so, I suppose, enthralled by the story. So unless there's anything else that you'd like to add as a closing note, we'll, we'll call it there, um, Margaret. I suppose as a closing note, I'd really like you to be very good mentors to the people you supervise, because so many of you are in, in the, uh, occupying those kind of roles, and that you would be really good role models for the, for the next generation of healthcare professionals, and to help them to be safe hands for the thousands of patients who will come under their care during their careers, and that they won't have sleepless nights, and that they won't be running away down a corridor. Because, to be honest with you, that registrar was the one individual that I had most respect for, because he, in fact, actually took on some level of personal responsibility for what had happened. And he wasn't being helped to, if you like, carry that cross in a way that would help him be more effective in the future, rather than he beating himself up. And I think as a family, we could have actually helped him to do that if we had been given the opportunity to speak with him. Because there is a thing about forgiveness. I've often been asked, can you forgive? And I usually say, it's not my place to forgive. I haven't lost my life. But what I certainly can do for healthcare is I can help healthcare forgive itself. Uh, actually, I see one question that came in there in terms of, do you think from your own personal experience, has anything changed since 1999 in terms of patient involvement in their care? Do you think things have progressed for the better? I think it's very patchy, and I think that's the bit that really frustrates people like me, because we are a small country. We have only 50-plus hospitals in this country if we just look at acute care. And we could actually be a pilot as a country as a healthcare system, for, uh, as a pilot for a model system. And I don't, and I think to answer your question, it's happening, it's patchy, it's ad hoc, 
It's not stitched into the system. And we will only know when that it has happened, when there are no more Margaret Murphy, when we don't, when there won't be patient advocates, because we won't at that point have anything to advocate about, because mm -hmm. you'll be actually doing it properly. Mm -hmm. Well, another nice message from the NRH there about listening with head and heart. I think you've sent a lot of people off with a lot to think about. So thanks a million again, Margaret, for your time. And just to say that our next WebEx will be on October 10th with Dr. David Vaughan, and his WebEx will be honing in on teamwork. So hopefully a lot of you will be able to join again. This will be available on the QI Talk Time webpage, the recording and the slides. So thanks a million, and hopefully we'll see you in two weeks' time.